many of you know, we have a fantastic visiting professor with us for these two days, today and tomorrow. And for those of you who know me, sorry about the voice, I know it sounds like a different person coming out of his body, but anyway, I'm at the end of it, this is laryngitis. So um, I want to start by saying a little bit about <clears throat> how we were able to bring Dr. Miller here. And uh, most of you have probably heard about the National Network of Depression Centers. And this is uh, an organization that consists of 26 different centers across the country. They're leading centers in the field of depression. And they come together to try to really make a, a bigger difference by integrating their efforts and working toward a number of different innovations, both research and education. Um, in addition, they have a patient registry that uh, is, has now about 9,000 people in it, which is fantastic. And they're able to follow the progress of certain people over time because they complete standardized measures. So the National Network of Depression Centers is a very important affiliate. And we are an affiliate of theirs. They're an affiliate of ours. And uh, we are one of those leading depression centers. And they have paid for everything so that we could, through a competitive grant that we received, bring Dr. Miller with us um, to help us all develop our expertise even more in behavioral immunology. So um, <clears throat> let me say a bit about Dr. Miller. <coughs> I'm so sorry, guys. So um, <clears throat> he received his medical degree from Medical College of Georgia and did his residency in psychiatry at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And in addition, I think you'd be interested to know that he trained with Marvin Stein at Mount Zion, uh, Mount Sinai, excuse me, School of Medicine, as well as with Bruce McEwen, who many of you know, sort of the, the guru of allostasis and allostatic load. Um, he studied with him as well at Rockefeller. And he's currently the William Timoney Timmy Professor and Vice Chair for Research in Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Emory School of Medicine. And what's interesting, <clears throat> and one of the very appealing things about Dr. Miller, is that not only is he director of Emory's Behavioral Immunology Program, but he's co-head of the Cancer Prevention um, and Control Program. So he really has a foot in many worlds, including the medical field, where he brings his expertise in psychiatry as well as in psychiatry, per se. Um, he's also <coughs> received numerous awards. Two of the ones I just wanted to mention, he got the Kurt Richter Award for, from the International Society of Psychoneuroendocrinology, and also the Norman Cousins Award from the Psychoneuroimmunology Research Society. And he is just internationally recognized uh, as a leader in the area of brain-immune interactions as they relate to depression. And so you'll be hearing today about the impressive work that he's doing in this field, both mechanistic studies and clinical trials. So with that, Dr. Miller. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Can everybody hear me? I yeah. probably don't even need this, but I guess you need it for your recording. Do my best. I tend to like to walk around. Um, Thank you, uh, Sandra and Alan, for persisting. I initially was a little hesitant to come. I kind of am a stubborn person and like to hide under the bed most of the time. So <laughs> getting me to go anywhere is a major feat. You guys somehow did it. And, and thank you very much for persisting. And I really appreciate that. Um, and it's, for me, you know, all I talk about is inflammation and what it does to the brain. So it's a real treat for me to be here to share with you what what we do, and hopefully uh, it will stimulate your mind to think about some of the things that inflammation uh, may be doing, and some of the model systems that you're looking at, and some of the research that you're doing. Um, we're going to focus on uh, depression today and the role of inflammation in depression. Um, and uh, touch on some of the other psychiatric disorders. I, I think most of you know, just to give us a little bit of context, know that depression is a devastating disease. It is extremely common. 10% of the, the U.S. adult population suffer from depression. It's the 10th leading cause of death by suicide. 
And um, uh, this, I think, was in the past year, the World Health Organization determined that, that depression is the leading cause of disability uh, worldwide. Um, but for those of us in psychiatry who treat depressed patients, probably the most vexing aspect of what we do is the fact that a number of the patients, in fact a significant proportion of patients, don't respond to our concurrent uh, therapies. And I've, listed, I've got a bunch of pills up here as a picture, but that, that really includes psychotherapy as well. So a third of our patients are not responding to conventional treatments. I think what that sort of suggests to us is that we need to be more creative we need to think outside the box. We need to come up with new conceptual frameworks, new ideas, new targets to improve the treatment of depression and ultimately um, uh, help these patients who are treatment resistant. And this is where the immune system comes into the equation. And I think most of you know uh, a little bit about the immune system. Inflammation is the body's natural response whenever you have a, 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 an infection with a pathogen or there's any tissue damage or destruction in the body. And for those of you who didn't go to medical school, I went to medical school and they taught us that uh, inflammation was the sine qua non of pathology. So just about every medical illness that you're dealing with will have some significant inflammation associated with it. And the problem comes not when you have a, 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 an infection or you have a, an illness that comes, it goes, there's an acute inflammatory response, it resolves. The problem is this chronic uh, inflammation that persists. And this persisting chronic inflammation can do damage to many parts of the body, and, and including the brain. And what we understand is in the context of chronic stress, in the context of obesity, metabolic syndrome, dysbiosis, these levels of chronic inflammation associated with these conditions can drive medical illnesses like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and uh, cancer. And this has really been one of the major insights uh, of of uh, in modern times in terms of our understanding of the pathophysiology of disease. And in addition to the effects of chronic inflammation on these disease processes, uh, inflammation can have functional consequences on your brain. Your immune system is talking to your brain in such a way that can change the way you perceive the world and, uh, and how you act. And ultimately, these functional changes that the immune system can have in the brain can manifest themselves as psychiatric symptoms, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So what is this notion that there's a connection between inflammation and depression? There's a huge literature in this area to support uh, this notion. First and foremost, and probably earliest on, was the observation that patients with depression, and it doesn't matter whether they're medically ill or medically healthy, have been found to exhibit all the cardinal features of inflammation, and that would include increases in inflammatory cytokines, both in the blood and the cerebrospinal fluid. Most of the studies have been done in the blood, and there have been a number of meta-analyses that have been published in this area. Hundreds of papers uh, have, uh, have come out. And interleukin-6 and TNF, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, are the most reliably elevated in depression in this regard. Also, there are evidence of increases in, uh, uh, in peripheral blood acute phase reactants. These are proteins that are produced by the liver in response to inflammatory cytokines. They help serve to sort of contain the inflammatory response as well as help clear pathogens. Uh, the immune system helps uh, it helps the immune system clear path pathogens, and C-reactive protein, or CRP, is the most reliably elevated in depressed patients uh, in the meta-analyses that have been conducted in the literature. There are also increases in peripheral blood chemokines, which are molecules that attract cells to the site of inflammation. One of the ones that we're going to be talking a little bit about is monocyte chemoattractant protein, or MCP1, also referred to as CCL2. 
And then there are increases in, in, in cellular adhesion molecules. And once those cells come to the, uh, to the tissues uh, where there's inflammation or infection, uh, that makes these cells stick and ultimately enter the tissues. You can go into the brain in post-mortem samples, of typically depressed suicide uh, victims. You'll see increased inflammatory markers, typically toll-like receptors, which bind pathogens and other molecules associated with uh, tissue damage and destruction and is associated with <coughs> activation of immune cells. There's activation of microglia in the brain. Uh, which are the immune cells of the brain. And there's also interesting, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, there's evidence that cells are trafficking to the brain in the context of depression. Now, something that's kind of an interesting sort of little sidelight to this, and maybe not so much a sidelight, is that there appears to be a special relationship between increases in inflammatory markers and treatment response. So that if you have high levels of inflammatory markers, you're less likely to respond to antidepressant therapies, particularly serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And if you're somebody who is treatment resistant, you're more likely to show increased inflammatory markers. This is just from a study that we recently published. Uh, this was a sample of depressed individuals all off medications at the time of the study, all depressed at the time of the study, and we asked the patients, well, how many treatment trials have you failed in your current episode of depression? And this is one, two, or three or more failed trials in the current episode. These are people who've never been treated, which is interesting, <coughs> responding to a social media ad, we have that many people who have not, uh, never been treated. But if you look at one, two, and three, you see the stepwise increase in and TNF, same thing with IL-6, same thing with the soluble receptor for TNF. And then if you look at C-reactive protein, you see a similar pattern, although, and the pattern was significant, although there were no specific differences between groups. So as your number of treatment failures increase, the likelihood of your having increased inflammation increases. The second major body of data that suggests that there's a link between inflammation and depression is you can administer inflammatory stimuli. You can either give uh, uh, individuals interferon alpha, which is an inflammatory cytokine, or typically in healthy volunteer studies, they give endotoxin or typhoid vaccination. And all of these inflammatory stimuli have been shown to cause depressive symptoms. So depressed patients, increased inflammatory markers, you give inflammation, people become depressed. And sort of completing the loop, if you will, you can inhibit inflammatory cytokines and that will decrease depressive symptoms. And this has primarily been seen in patients with autoimmune and inflammatory uh, disorders who are receiving immunotherapies, uh, typically uh, anti-cytokine therapies uh, for their treatment. And so if you block inflammation in these individuals, you see less depression. Now there's a very small literature suggesting that maybe if you give an anti-inflammatory to somebody who's depressed and otherwise healthy, that that might improve depressive symptoms. That's a very weak literature and that's actually where the rubber meets the road. That's where all of this uh, will, uh, will ultimately matter or not. And uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, about that later in a, in a trial that we, we conducted in this area. So there's quite a substantial literature that suggests that the immune system may be playing a role in depression. Now based on this literature, um, and we were as guilty as anyone, people started to ask the question, well maybe depression is an inflammatory disorder. I think you've probably seen this, like Times, you can throw these articles up and see this in the, in the lay press. And, um, and the answer to this question is absolutely not. And, and you know, all of the hype around this uh, it has really led to a very mistaken impression. And we should have realized pretty early on, if you just look at the data, that it's pretty obvious that depression only occurs in a subgroup of depressed individuals. Yeah, inf increased inflammation. Here we're looking at plasma interleukin-6 in depressed patients. These are uh, healthy individuals, depressed and healthy controls. These are depressed cancer patients. And cancer patients um, without depression, it's a study we did a number of years ago. 
we should have seen it early on. Here you can see that even though the main differences between these groups are significant, if you actually look at the individual data there, you can see that increased inflammation is occurring in a small group of, uh, subgroup of these individuals. And in depressed patients who are otherwise med medically healthy, that represents somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 percent of depressed patients will exhibit evidence of increased inflammation. And as you move into populations where there are other things going on, where there's tissue damage and destruction, say like from chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, that uh, the cancer patients are subjected to, you'll see that, that that percentage will go up. So if you want to know what is the percentage of patients with increased inflammation and depression, it really depends on the patient population. And so if you have patients with medical illness, it could be as high as 50% of patients may have high inflammation in association with their uh, depressive symptoms. So not only are, uh, is inflammation only increased in a subgroup of patients, but also inflammation is increased in pretty much every other disorder you can think of in psychiatry and, and, and in, in, in neurology and medicine as well. This used to drive me crazy when all these other papers, because I'm working on depression, I think we've got a little, we've cornered the market here. This is inflammation, depression, it's an inflammatory disorder, again, with all of the hype that went into this early on, and we were sobered up uh, by seeing that the papers that started coming out with increases in bipolar disorder, in anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, neurodegenerative disorders, medical illnesses, all high inflammation in association with behavioral changes. So where does that leave us? And this is really where the state of the art is right now. But what we understand is that inflammation's effects on behavior are not about any disorder at all. It has nothing to do with any particular psychiatric illness or any other medical disorder. Inflammation is really about the fact that if you have increased inflammation, that that has very specific effects on neurotransmitter systems in your brain, neurocircuits in your brain, and symptoms related to those neurocircuits, and that occurs across disorders. So if you have increased inflammation, you've got all of this stuff going on in your brain, and we're going to talk about that today. So let's just take a brief um, a side road here and talk a little bit, well, where does this chronic inflammation come from? And that's a much longer story if we wanted to get into evolution and all the things that have to do with we as human beings and why we as human beings have very aggressive immune responses because we sort of developed in ancestral times in an environment that was heavily laden with pathogens. So if you didn't have a pretty aggressive immune system, you're not sitting in this room right now. Um, but in modern times, there are other sources of inflammation, and probably the biggest one that we see in the clinic is obesity, um, chronic stress, um, early life stress has been associated, uh, childhood maltreatment has been associated with increased inflammation. You can stress individuals, that causes increased inflammation. They actually call that sterile inflammation because there are certain danger associated molecular patterns that are re released by stress cells that can activate the immune system. I know that some of the people here are looking at the microbiome, dysbiosis. If you have uh, disruption in the microbiome in the gut, for example, this can lead to leakage of bacteria and bacterial products into the bloodstream, which then activates immune cells and can lead to chronic uh, inflammation. As I mentioned, chronic illnesses, chronic infections, uh, various hepatitis uh, infections, uh, particular uh, relevant in this regard, and then of course a whole host of treatments that we, uh, we give to patients, including the surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy that I mentioned before. And in the cancer center where, where we work, we see very high levels of inflammation in association with any number of um, behavioral changes, including symptoms that overlap with those that we typically associate with depression. So one of the questions that has people have struggled with in terms of trying to understand, well, how is inflammation influencing the brain? And I'm largely talking about inflammation that's arising in the periphery. We're not talking about people with MS or, or Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease where there are actually lesions in the brain, stroke, 
Um, and there you have a, an actual inflammatory response in the brain. Uh, so what we're really talking about is how does the immune signal the brain if the, if the uh, inflammation is coming from the periphery. And much of the attention has been paid to these first two pathways, the humeral pathway, this is really has to do with leaky regions in the blood-brain barrier and circumventricular organs. This plays an important role in the development of fever. There are active transport molecules where cytokines can bind to one side of the blood-brain barrier and be transported to the other side of the blood-brain barrier and into the brain. There's a neural pathway where sensory afferent fibers have receptors for cytokines and uh, cytokines can bind these receptors and then the signals get sent back up into the brain. This also uh, particularly involves the vagus and plays a role in fever as well. But the new kid on the block is this cellular pathway and everybody's really excited about this notion because we're starting to see evidence that this is occurring especially in stress which is a precipitant of symptoms in uh, many of the diseases that we, we treat in psychiatry. And what we understand from animal studies is this cellular pathway involves activations of neurons during stress, which in turn activate microglia, which release that chemokine, monocyte chemotractin protein, and that then attracts immune cells to the brain. And so this is uh, a pathway that, that has become of increasing interest to us and potentially uh, someday a target of therapy. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it. These, uh, here we're looking at cells in the brain. These are post-mortem samples from non-human primates. These are rhesus monkeys that we have developed the rhesus monkey model of cytokine-induced depression. We administer the animals interferon alpha and they develop depressive-like symptoms, much like you see in humans administered this inflammatory cytokine. This is a control uh, animal up here, uh, or control uh, is from one single control animal, which is pretty consistent across animals. And here we're looking in areas of the basal ganglia and the, and the ventral striatum. And this is a control animal, and here you can see the, the, the massive amount of green, which is staying to activated immune cells, microglia in the parenchyma of the brain. So you're seeing activation of microglia and a proliferation of microglia in the brain as a function of interferon alpha treatment. You also see perivascular accumulation of macrophages and monocytes uh, in the tissues and then a pouring of activated uh, monocytes, macrophages into the meninges in these uh, brain regions that are sitting in subcortical areas. Uh, near the striatum, which play an important role in reward uh, behavior. This has also been demonstrated in humans. Postmortem samples from control individuals and depressed suicide victims indicated in uh, these little white uh, stars here are blood vessels in the brain. And what you see here is that in controls you don't see much going on and staining in brown are the perivascular macrophages that are shown to be increased staining in the brain. So what we're seeing in depression in postmortem brain samples is that there is this evidence of immune cell traffic into the brain, much like we saw in the, uh, in the rhesus animals administered interferon alpha. Interesting, they did uh, sampling of the tissue in this area and found that there was an increased expression of monocyte chemotractin protein 1. So that CCL2 appears to keep coming up it's associated with aging, it's associated with a number of infectious illnesses, and really involves uh, movement of cells, uh, particularly to the brain and other tissues. And so they uh, saw that in this, in this particular study. Now, given that we have cells that are moving toward the brain, I wanted to share with you some kind of a really neat study that was done by um, Scott Rousseau and his group at Mount Sinai, suggesting that in the context of stress, not only do you have these cells that are trafficking to the brain, but the blood-brain barrier seems to be opening up in the context of stress. And so they have a, a model that they've published on uh, numerous times. I don't know how you can see, how much you can see. This is a, uh, a mouse uh, a mouse here and they what they do is a chronic social defeat stress and in this stressor they expose this little mouse here to a bully mouse a big mouse uh, that kind of terrorizes this poor mouse here and uh, this mouse is stressed as a function of being exposed daily for 10 days to this larger mouse and then they put this 
mouse into a social interaction test and see if that mouse is interested in a novel mouse. And what you see is that animals sort of line up along those who are stress sensitive and those who are stress resistant. And you can see this is the social interaction of the stress sensitive ones. They're not pretty, they're not very interested in interacting socially. And that's kind of considered a, a depressive like phenotype. And the resistant animals look no different than the controls. Well, what they did in this study, which was kind of cool, is that at the end of this whole business, they injected the animals with a green labeled interleukin-6. And what they did was then look in uh, multiple brain areas, but they saw most of the action in this same area that I showed you before, which is in this nucleus accumbens, uh, ventral striatal brain region. What they saw, and here's the control animals here, I don't know whether you can see, this is the blood-brain barrier in red, and you don't see much of anything in here. What you see along here is that, that, brick, that in the stress-sensitive animal, you see this red um, uh, blood-brain barrier is disrupted, and you see that inside the brain, you're getting interleukin-6. Um, in the uh, stress-resistant animals, no interleukin-6 is getting across. So what that's suggesting is stress is not only leading to this trafficking of immune cells to the brain, but the blood-brain barrier is becoming permeable to molecules like interleukin-6 as a function of stress sensitivity. They went a little bit farther to figure out, well, what is the mechanism of this? And they found that it was related to decreased expression of Claudin-5. And I won't go through all the experiments that they did to prove that, but just suffice to say that Claudin-5 protein expression was decreased uh, in stress-sensitive animals compared to resistant animals and was associated with the, the amount of social interaction in these animals. And Claudin-5 plays an, uh, an integral role in brain uh, blood-brain barrier integrity and its decrease uh, is associated with a leaky blood-brain barrier. And here you can see over here, I don't know how well this is showing up, but it probably shows up pretty well. You can see some green here, you can maybe see some green down here. These are the resilient, these are the controls, and then the stress-sensitive animals. Not only do you see a disruption of the blood-brain barrier uh, indicated here, but if you look at Claudin-5 uh, expression, it's markedly decreased in the stress-sensitive an uh, animals. They went on from there and went into the nucleus accumbens, this ventral striatal uh, brain region associated with reward, and looked to see if there was decreased Claudin-5 in post-mortem brain samples from depressed patients, and again found decreased Claudin-5 in patients with depression, whether they were on antidepressants or not, in two different uh, samples of, of uh, cohorts of patients from uh, two different sites. So what it appears is that during stress, cells traffic to the brain, the blood-brain barrier opens up, cytokines can be released and get into the blood, uh, through the blood-brain barrier um, by virtue of uh, reductions in Claudin-5. So now that we have cytokines into the brain, what do they do? <coughs> what kind of effects do these cytokines have on neurocircuits and neurotransmitter systems that mediate? Uh, what, are, what are they that mediate these effects of um, inflammation on behavior? Now, you'd have to have me for another week uh, for us to go through all of the uh, data that, that has been developed in this area, but suffice it to say, I've sort of summarized it here. If you look at mono, monoamine metabolism, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, what you see is you see decreased synthesis, decreased release, and increased reuptake. Okay? And uh, you also see, in, as far as glutamate metabolism is concerned, you see increased release, decreased reuptake, so you see an excessive amount of glutamate, which leads to extrasynaptic glutamate spillover, which is toxic to neurons. And in the hippocampus, they've shown that there's a decreased production of growth factors like uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, and decreased neurogenesis. Now, if you think of the way antidepressants work, they work by blocking the reuptake of uh, monoamines. And look what inflammation is doing. It's increasing the reuptake pumps and their, uh, and their uh, function. So both number and function are increases. They're acting on neurotransmitter systems that our conventional antidepressants don't have any effect on. 
And many of our conventional antidepressants are believed to be dependent on neurogenesis to do their thing. So now you can understand potentially of how inflammation is undermining the effects of uh, conventional antidepressants and even psychotherapy in terms of resolving depression. Now, um, given these effects on these various neurotransmitter systems, it appears from the literature, and there's been a number of neuroimaging studies that's, that have been done in this area, that are, there are two major neurocircuit, uh, neurocircuits that appear to be affected. One has to do with anxiety involving the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, insula, amygdala, to some extent the hippocampus, and then another circuit that's involved in anhedonia involving the basal ganglia, ventral striatum, and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and subgenual anterior cingulate cortex. So two major circuits leading to symptoms of anhedonia, which I think most of you know is a loss of interest or pleasure, loss of motivation, core symptom of depression, and then of course anxiety um, uh, is as the other symptom. And I'm going to focus primarily on this <coughs> anhedonia, which is the uh, where most of our work has been focused over the years. So in order to study uh, anhedonia in the context of inflammation, uh, our group has seized on the opportunity of the administration of the inflammatory cytokine interferon alpha. I showed you the monkey model that we used before. Well, the same thing happens, as I mentioned, in humans, where you administer interferon alpha to humans. They become depressed, about half of them do. And so we were interested to see, does interferon alpha affect uh, uh, anhedonia or hedonic reward uh, and, a, and a hedonic reward task using functional magnetic resonance imaging. We're particularly interested in this area right in here, which includes the nucleus accumbens as well as the tag of the caudate and the putamen, and this is called the provincial striatum. And the task that we did is the patients get into the scanner, and they look up, and they're looking at two cards face down, and they pick a card, and if they pick a red card, they win a dollar. If they pick a black card, they lose a dollar. And of course, we rig the game, so everybody wins 30, 40 bucks. They're being paid to be in the scanner. They're all happy. And um, if you look in the brain, and you look at the win versus lose condition, you see very nice activation there of this ventral striatal brain region. However, when you go in to compare those individuals who are receiving interferon alpha, and in this case they're receiving interferon alpha for hepatitis C, you see significant reductions in neural activity in the ventral striatum, right, <coughs> left, and bilaterally, in interferon alpha treated patients compared to controls. And then if you map that decreased neural activation in the ventral striatum onto motivation, you see that the lower the activation in the win versus lose task, the greater the amount of reduced motivation. And you should notice that there's a clustering of these red dots in each of these uh, panels. Uh, and this is in the ventral striatum again. There's a clustering of inter, uh, uh, individuals receiving interferon alpha, suggesting that the reduction of neural activation in the ventral striatum is associated with increases in reduced motivation or increases in the anhedonia in uh, these individuals. Now, our work is focused largely on interferon alpha, but I should just mention that this same results have been also demonstrated in healthy volunteers given endotoxin, I don't know what you can probably see it better over here, and as well as typhoid vaccination. Both of these inflammatory stimuli acutely reduce ventral striatal activation in association with depressive symptoms, including anhedonia. So here you have a situation where you have three different inflammatory stimuli uh, studied in three different laboratories, and you're getting exactly the same results. So this is a very consistent finding of what inflammation does to the brain. Hopefully you're beginning to see a pattern of where cytokines are going and where the brain is being affected. So in order to study this and try to get a little bit of a better understanding of what might be going on at a neurotransmitter level, um, we went back to our rhesus monkey uh, model where uh, the chronic administration of interferon alpha, we put a dialysis probe to do in vivo microdialysis. We put it just north of that ventral striatal region and these, these probes can both sample extracellular fluid as well as put various drugs in and we put in potassium which causes a 
dopamine released through a, dope, a voltage dependent mechanism and we also did amphetamine which stimulates the release of amphetamine and blocks its reuptake. And if you look under baseline conditions, these are monkeys treated for four weeks uh, with interferon alpha. Look at what happens to dopamine, it's plummeting. Under baseline conditions, you see this marked decrease in dopamine, you see marked decrease in holobinolic acid, which is the prim primary metabolite of dopamine. And then if you go in and stimulate and put those drugs in like potassium and amphetamine, you see this very wimpy release of dopamine in response to these stimuli. So clearly there is a reduction in not only the amount of dopamine to start with, but the amount of dopamine that is being released in these animals as a function of interferon alpha. And it's occurring in the same brain region where we saw uh, the decrease in neural activation, and it's occurring in the same brain region where you saw the blood-brain barrier permeability associated with stress. Um, this has also been demonstrated in rats, so this is work of John Salomon at the uh, University of Connecticut. He's given interleukin-6 uh, to rats, and these are different uh, locations, in, again, in the nucleus accumbens, in this kind of ventral striatal area, but particularly in the nucleus accumbens, sampling in multiple areas. And what he found is after 30 minutes of administration of a single dose of interleukin-6, given interperitoneally, that these animals are showing significant decreases in extracellular dopamine using in vivo microdialysis. So same findings, basically. We're using a chronic inflammatory stimulus. This is an acute inflammatory stimulus causing decreases <coughs> of um, interleukin-6 in this same brain region that seems, seems to keep popping. Now, uh, based on uh, the literature that, that we have gathered, and I don't really have time to get into, um, we have shown that uh, there seems to be a relationship between decreased dopamine and, um, and uh, a synthesis problem uh, relative to dopamine, and particularly related to the enzyme cofactor tetrahydrobiopterin, or BH4. And um, we see reductions in BH4 in relation with IL-6, and then reductions in BH4 in association with decreases in dopamine. So uh, Jennifer Felger in our group decided she would jump over all of that, and by reverse microdialysis, put in L-DOPA, which is the immediate precursor of <coughs> dopamine. And what she found is she had administered by reverse microdialysis a levodopa, she was able to completely restore a normal response in these interferon alpha-treated animals, which suggests to us that these dopaminergic neurons can take up that L-dopa, can make dopamine, can package it, and then release it. And the reason we know they're packaging it is because if it was just sitting in the neuron, it would be broken down by relevant enzymes, and you'd see an increase in the dopac to dopamine ratio, and we saw no change in that ratio. So that suggests that the vesicular monoamine transporter appears to be intact as a function of, of inflammation. And again, supporting our idea that it may be a synthesis problem. So much of the literature, if you look at it in terms of the effects of inflammation in the brain, is the literature I just showed you, which is giving inflammatory stimuli to uh, pay, uh, to people to animals, and then looking at what goes on in the brain. So what does any of this have to do with depression? So we've come back to depression, and we've asked the question, do these effects of, of, of inflammation on the ventral striatum and, the, and dopamine, does this affect anything that has to do with patients with depression? And in order to study this, we used resting state functional connectivity so we could look at connections between various areas of the brain. And we use the ventral striatum as the seed region. And, in, and when you're doing resting state functional connectivity, you're looking to see are different brain regions in sync or out of sync. And if they're in sync, then that suggests to us that those two brain regions are communicating with one another and are connected. And in order to sort of map this on, and we were particularly interested just uh, at, at a, by the way, we're particularly interested in this ventral striatum where we saw all those changes that I showed you before with interferon alpha. 
we're particularly interested in this circuit from the ventral striatum to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is in red for a reason, because that is the heart of your reward circuitry. Now you can notice that there are some dorsal regions here in the striatum, and these are largely related to motor control, so they're going up into the motor strip, supplementary motor area. So this is uh, areas that involve both uh, uh, motivation as well as motor activity. But ventral striatum to ventral medial prefrontal cortex, heart of the reward circuit. So that was a circuit that we were particularly interested in. As an index of inflammation, because now we're not giving inflammatory stimuli to these individuals, we're looking at their endogenous inflammation. So to, to, as an index of endogenous inflammation, we use the C-reactive protein that we talked about before, produced by the liver. And, and because inflammation plays such an important role in these other illnesses that I talked about, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, et cetera, the American Heart Association and the CDC have come up with guidelines as to what's high, medium, and low inflammation. And CRP can be measured in the clinic. You can do it in your patients. You can do it yourself. You go to the doctor and say, well, what is my inflammation level? Well, it's high. You should get it down. Um, low inflammation, less than one. One to three is average. And greater than three is high. And this all has to do with your risk for developing uh, heart disease, although these serve as very handy ways to determine levels of inflammation in patients. And what we did was to look at the level of inflammation as it goes up, what happens to the connectivity of that ventral striatal region to all areas of the brain. So we didn't select any particular area, even though we were particularly interested in that ventral medial prefrontal cortex, we looked at the whole brain. So in a whole brain analysis, the region that popped up, and I don't know how well you can see it, it's in blue, blue means if it's going in the bluer direction, that's decreased connectivity. Uh, what you see is if you put your seed in the, in the ventral striatum, and the seed would, this was the maximal area that we saw decreases in the interferon alpha treated patients. Remember, these are depressed patients now. As inflammation went up, connectivity to these regions went down. So what inflammation is doing is tanking your reward circuitry. And the biggest effect size that we had was in this reward circuit. And you can look at this any number of different ways. If you're interested, read the paper. And, um, and you can see that uh, this is a very solid finding here. You can see it graphed. The higher the CRP, the lower the connectivity between ventral striatum and ventral medial prefrontal cortex, that reward circuit. We've shown this now in breast cancer patients. We've shown it in monkeys fed a high fat diet. They start showing decreased connectivity in these reward circuits. And between us, since I guess this is being recorded, <laughs> there's data to suggest in the Embark study that they're also seeing the same thing. And that's a completely different group doing fMRI different ways. And so this seems to be, uh, it, it's moving in the right direction as being a very solid finding and a target in the brain. Uh, the reviewers who reviewed this paper said, well, you know, we already know CRP is associated with anhedonia. We already know that uh, connectivity in this brain region is associated with anhedonia. So what, how does this all fit together? So we did a mediation analysis, and what we found is that the most significant uh, path analysis here is that CRP is affecting the circuitry in the brain from ventral striatum to ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and that in turn is leading to anhedonia. Okay? So this is where we are in psychiatry where we talk about all these circuits and how they relate to symptoms. And I always raise my hand when I hear these people talking about psychiatry is now all going to be about circuit disorders. Um, I always raise my hand and say, well, what's causing the circuits? Where, where's the problem that these circuits are disrupted in the first place? Inflammation is one pathway that can disrupt these circuits, okay? And that's something we can treat, okay? Uh, let me just mention briefly that we saw similar findings with psychomotor activity, but that was in the dorsal striatum, not that thing. <coughs> So what are the translational implications of this work? 
Well, Jennifer Felger has done some studies where she moved from the monkey to the humans. Now we're looking at depressed patients and we're looking at connectivity between these regions she had identified in the, in the previous study that I showed you. And she decided she would give levodopa to the humans. Not in the brain, but by mouth. And she gave cinnamon. This is pharmacologic fMRI. So what you're doing is you're doing a resting state scan, which we've talked about before. And in those scans, patients just sit and stare across. And then you're looking at the connectivity between the different regions. Are they in sync or not? Um, and she does a baseline scan, gives a dose of L-DOPA or placebo, and then uh, does a, a repeat scan, all done in the same day. Under the, in the baseline scan, you see this decreased connectivity in individuals with high uh, C-reactive protein greater than three, okay? And what happens after you give a dose of levodopa? Nothing happens in the low inflammation group, but you completely reverse the decreased connectivity that you see in the high inflammation group. Not only does it return to normal, but it actually overshoots suggesting that there may be some hypersensitivity in these pathways related to dopamine. So for those of you who treat patients, what does this mean? Well, this is what I do. Patients with high inflammation, as I identify by C-reactive protein, I'm looking more at drugs that affect dopamine than I am looking at serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Okay. And we're trying to get these in larger clinical trials so that you could do a point of care CRP from a simple finger stick, which you can do, get CRP, and make a decision about what kind of drug you might use. And these are all drugs that uh, increase the availability of dopamine. And then Prampexol, which has um, shown some, uh, some efficacy in treatment of resistant depression. Uh, is a dopamine agonist, directly stimulates. So you don't have to worry that your synthesis, you don't have any dopamine to begin with, which is a problem. You start giving stimulants, the patients feel fabulous, and then after a couple of weeks, they don't have any more dopamine, they don't feel so great anymore, and they're not happy with you. Uh, this is just some, some clinical data to support this. This is a, pap a paper from Maduka Trivedi's group. They used a CRP less than one and greater than one as their cut point. Look what happens if you give a SSRI monotherapy to somebody who has higher inflammation, a 29% <coughs> response rate. If you give it to people with low inflammation, they degrade. That's a 50% response. This is remission, 57% remission rate. Huge difference based solely on CRP. These are post hoc analyses. If you give bupropion, if you add bupropion to the treatment, a drug that blocks the reuptake of dopamine, you restore that response in the individuals with high inflammation. So if you do a biomarker match treatment, you're getting a 52% response versus a biomarker, biomarker mismatch treatment that's closer to 30% uh, uh, percent remission rate. So I'm, I'm approaching a doubling based on using a biomarker to guide treatment selection. So let me finish up by talking a little bit about the obvious. Well, if, if, if I'm going on and on about inflammation, why don't we just block inflammation, not worry about all this dopamine junk, okay? Uh, and blocking inflammation is, is not as simple as it seems because when you want to block inflammation, you really want to block inflammation. You have to use drugs like this and this is Remicade or Infliximab, uh, and it is a TNF blocker. It's a monoclonal antibody to TNF. These are the drugs that are used to treat ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, as well as other autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis. These drugs are extremely potent. You see them advertised all the time on TV. The psoriasis drugs are the ones that are the big ones now. But you always notice, they say, well, this drug can kill you because you could get infected, basically. If you knock the immune system down, as I said, inflammation is fighting infection. So if you remove the inflammation, you're not going to be so great at fighting infection. So that's a problem. It hasn't really turned out to be as big a problem as everybody worried. And these have been game changers in this particular um, uh, area of medicine. Uh, we like these drugs because they have no off-target effects. This is like doing a study in an in a, in a animal model because these are specific. These are highly specific drugs. They're monoclonal antibodies. That's how you would do it short of a knockout. That's how you do an animal study. So you can do these studies in humans. 
and um, limited drug-drug interactions so people could be on drugs when you're doing this. We did a double-blind randomized trial. We did this in treatment-resistant depression. We stratified the patients on sex and their level of inflammation. 30 patients per group, so a small study with three infusions of infliximab or placebo. And, uh, and then we did a, a number of psychiatric assessments along the way. I should just point out, we advertised for people who were treatment resistant for this study, so it was just a social media campaign. Notice, first thing, BMI over 30 is obese. So our sample on average was obese. Look at these baseline CRP levels. Five, uh, close to six in the sample as a whole. And, and reasonably depressed. Um, if you do the calculations and you run all the numbers, 50% of our TRD, almost 50% or 45%, had high inflammation according to our CDC and their American Heart Association, greater than three. And if you kind of take the number of people who are depressed, the number of people who are treatment resistant, the number of the people who are treatment resistant with high inflammation, you end up with a number of four million, which actually uh, is higher than the total number of people with rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease combined. So this is a this is a, uh, a right population to, to be thinking about in terms of development of new treatments. These are the results. I myself almost committed suicide when I saw these. I mean, getting patients into this study with a black box warning that you could die if you participate in the study was, was not easy. Um, but this study was conceived um, at the time with that brain on fire. We thought everybody, we thought all of depression was related to inflammation. So of course, if we gave an anti-inflammatory, everybody would get better. But it took us a while to get the trial completed and, and the field matured in the meantime. And we realized, well, it may be that there are subgroups of individuals who might respond. And so we entered into the equation people's uh, baseline C-reactive protein and found that, yes, indeed, uh, your baseline C-reactive protein significantly uh, predicted your, your treatment response over time in the study. So it mattered what your baseline CRP was. And the way the data looks, and this is um, baseline um, uh, to week 12 response, so this is an improvement and you're looking at infliximab minus placebo. If you're over here, you're uh, favoring placebo. Over here, you're uh, uh, favoring infliximab. You can see if you look at all study participants, actually placebo outperformed infliximab in this study. But if you begin to cull the patients down with higher and higher levels of inflammation, when you get up to a CRP greater than five, you're seeing almost a three point difference in favor of infliximab over placebo. In the FDA, that's, their, that's sort of their sweet zone. Three point difference is, is considered a clinically significant difference, at least by National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidelines from the UK. Um, and that's for regular depression. For treatment resistant, it's a two point difference in a Hamilton uh, score. These are Hamilton depression scores. Uh, so you can see as your inflammation goes up, you're starting to see evidence of clinical response, but the CRP greater than five was 30%, and this is closer to, as I said, 45% of our sample. A little easier way to look at it, high CRP greater than five, almost a doubling of response, placebo compared to infliximab, this is a 50% reduction in Hamilton scores, and it flips when you get in patients with lower inflammation, where actually uh, placebo does better. And if you look at the two groups uh, um, uh, alone, um, it, it, there's no difference. We looked at gene predictors of response, and um, not surprisingly, if you looked at infliximab responders versus non-responders, TNF and nuclear factor kappa B, which is an inflammatory signal signaling mod molecule at baseline predicted response to infliximab. I just point out here that there are other pathways that have to do with glucose metabolism and lipid metabolism. And this relates to some of our recent work, uh, very recent work that is looking at the relationship between metabolism and inflammation and its effects on the brain. 
Uh, you can pick out an infliximab responder after six hours, the first infusion. So these are infliximab responders versus not and already reductions in TNF uh, at six and 24 hours are predicting gene expression uh, responses are showing prediction of response. And the, those toll-like receptors are showing uh, decreased um, expression at two weeks. If you look at the symptoms that improved, uh, here we're going from baseline to week 12. So if you're going in this direction, you're getting negative. That means an improvement in symptoms. And the symptoms that are getting better are, and these are the Hamilton 17 item, Hamilton depression uh, score items. Mood and act, uh, work and activity is the <coughs> anhedonia item. Uh, psychomotor slowing is the retardation item. Anxiety is that anxiety circuit that I told you before. But the circuits that are showing or the symptoms that are showing the greatest effect on infliximab are exactly those circuits that I've tried to beat you over the head with in terms of what inflammation does to the brain. It influences motivation, it influences motor activity through effects on the basal ganglia, and it also affects these anxiety circuits, which we don't really work on. So where is the field going? Uh, what, are the, what, are, what are the questions? What are, what are the future directions? We need to understand more about the immunology of this. We need to figure out how inflammation is affecting these neurotransmitters. Is it synthesis? Is it reuptake? Is it all of these, all of the above? We need to know more about characterizing these patients with increased inflammation uh, at multiple levels, allowing us to get closer and closer to precision medicine for these, for these individuals. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and just to acknowledge all the people that are involved in these kinds of studies and, and the uh, various agencies that support this work. And I'll stop there. And, I think we have probably a couple minutes for questions. <coughs> Anybody has questions? So what about diets to reduce inflammation? And what, so what do you recommend? For so um, I'm, I'm doing a public talk, and that's where oh. I'm <laughs> late tomorrow. But I, you know, I don't have to go, obviously. <laughs> um, so there is no diet. There is no anti-inflammatory diet. That there are a ton out there yeah. that claim this, that, and the other thing. Probably the best diet in terms of inflammation that's got the most data for it is the Mediterranean diet. So heavy fruits and veg vegetables and, and certain oils, olive oils, nuts, fish. Uh, that has the, the, the greatest effects on inflammation. We actually did a, a, a fairly large study in this area of Viola Baccarino is the, I think, the last author on that paper. And what we did is to take a, a large number of individuals and in, who had dietary histories and look to see who was closest to the Mediterranean diet in terms of what they ate. And we measured interleukin-6 in those patients, and there was a stepwise decrease in interleukin-6 associated with that. Randomized trials, I think people are interested in that because we now recognize how important inflammation is to our health. And it probably is the biggest threat to our health of all the things I mean, that are happening internally. I mean, obviously we do things like smoke or we do things that, that are, are not, we eat too much, but all of those end up at the end of the day increasing inflammation, which then tanks everything uh, in the body. Um, well, where would you be thinking of going if you're interested in changing chronic inflammation um, the drug you use might be especially effective acutely, and it's kind of a proof of concept uh, issue, but over the long run, it would be similar to when you said if your uh, C-reactive protein is over three, you might want to think about getting that down. How would you think about getting that down yeah. over the long run? Uh, that's sort of why we went more with why we focused more on the dopamine, because many of these patients come in, they have no motivation, um, and it's very hard to get them exercising. Probably exercise is the best thing to get inflammation down and losing weight. Uh, and if people aren't motivated to, to do those things, then you've got a problem. So from a clinical standpoint, I would move more to a medication to, to get patients engaged in the process and then uh, begin to, to uh, institute lifestyle changes, losing weight, 
improving a diet, increasing physical activity, and doing those things. I don't think any of the anti-inflammatories like Advil or ibuprofen, the COX inhibitors, I don't think they're ready for prime time right now. And certainly the drug that, that we're talking about here is way not ready for prime time. So I think in terms of what can you do in the clinic now, that would be, um, that would be my approach. And you know, a lot of these patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, and you know, the, the, we go that way. If they have high inflammation, I'll treat them. If they don't, I, I can't help them. But if they do, and I really go to town on the dopamine, there are a lot of patients that will get significantly better. And we didn't talk about the glutamate story, but that's also another angle that could be done. Oh, thanks, it was a really interesting talk. Uh, you talked a lot about um, IL-6 and markers of inflammation, and how that affects the reward circuitry. And there was a meta-analysis that came out of um, looking at inflammatory markers in the CSF for patients with schizophrenia and psychosis. And one of the significant um, inflammatory markers was an increase in IL-6. And I wonder if you know if there's any data invoking IL-6 in sort of negative symptoms in schizophrenia, or might we think that it's doing something else in that disease? Excellent question, and we're actually studying that now with the idea that negative symptoms are being driven. Uh, by increases in inflammation in schizophrenic patients. And as you know, that if you give second generation antipsychotic drugs to, to your patients, they get big, they get metabolic syndrome, and they look like that patient I had, uh, or that person I had up on the slides as causes of chronic inflammation. And does that chronic inflammation then drive negative symptoms? And we all know treating psychotic patients, what do you want? You want a quiet patient. So if you have a lot of negative symptoms, people don't tend to complain. It's horrible for the patients, for the families. You know, I'd rather, you know, so-and-so be quiet in their room than, you know, running up and down the steps screaming or out in the streets and all this kind of stuff. So it really gets into all sorts of issues around treating these patients. But yes, there is, number one, there is data linking inflammation to negative symptoms that uh, we published on that. So if you look up um, David Goldsmith, uh, DR Goldsmith, you'll see a number of patients. There was recently one on deficit syndrome and TNF and IL-6 in those patients. Um, and there have been some other studies that have looked at correlations. And he recently did one with the Naples study where if you have high uh, TNF, it predicts the development of psychosis in kids at risk for, for uh, there high risk. There was somebody trying to we have time for one more. Go ahead. So, I'm, that's super interesting. Thank you. So, immunology is moving a lot towards understanding inflammation in specific ways, right? Towards viruses, towards bacteria, and there are subtypes. Um, but I feel like many of those subtypes might have increases in IL-6. And so, do you see psychiatry moving towards more specificity in the types of inflammation that are occurring? Yeah, and, and already we're beginning to, you know, as we move in the neuroimaging area, we're starting to look at individuals who have increased inflammation and have the neuroimaging markers. So we're actually subtyping those who have high inflammation from a behavioral or from a neuroimaging standpoint. So that's, you, once you start going down that path, then you're starting to go down the path of, well, are there immunologic subtypes? Are there individuals who have a certain type of inflammation? And, and as you, you know, obviously it sounds like you know a little bit about immunology, what they've seen in, di you know, the movement from pre-diabetes to diabetes is they've suggested that at first it starts out as a monocytic process, that monocytes are producing inflammation, are responsible for the inflammation, and then as the inflammation uh, matures, if you will, it moves to more to a T cell phenomena, and you start to see Th17 cells, production of IL-17. So there may be very different, there may be subtypes here, and so I give a TNF, it may be completely irrelevant to somebody who's, whose inflammation is being driven largely by T cells. Uh, and you would want to see something more like some of the IL-17 drugs that are out there. So phenotyping, doing a deeper phenotype in terms of people's immunologic responses is absolutely, I think I had it as the number one, the number one thing that we need to do is we need to do more immunology. 
and we need to start looking at you know what are the pathways that are involved and are there specific pathways that map on to some of these changes because not all the patients you know it's like everything in psychiatry not not all the patients ex with high inflammation exhibit these changes just like not all depressed patients exhibit high inflammation so yeah absolutely it's a good question Oh, I'm so sorry, we're going to have to wind up. That was fantastic. Thank you.